Hey guys, this is Echo Soundworks with ADSR. In this video, we're going to switch things up a little bit. Instead of doing a technical tip and trick or a how-to in a synth or how to produce a certain genre of music, I'm going to be talking about six mistakes I wish I wouldn't have made when I started out with music production. All right, so mistake number one. If I could go back in time and slap myself in the face and say, don't do this, I would say, learn everything there is to learn about your DAW that you've chosen to use and learn all of the key commands and even customize those key commands to to further enhance your workflow. So, so when I started out producing, uh, the first DAW I started using was Logic. It was, I think it was Logic 7 at the time. And I remember thinking, I just want to get good enough to get my ideas down. Well, that's a dangerous thought because the better you are in your DAW, the more comfortable you are, the less friction you're going to have when you're trying to do something. So if you have an idea and you know everything there's to know in your DAW, you can just do it. If you need to go spend 15, 20 minutes either watching a tutorial or just messing around to figure it out, it's going to ruin the creative ebb and flow. And it's also just going to eat into the amount of time you have to work on your music. So custom key commands, try to set those up in your DAW. Every DAW allows you to do that. And it is incredible. I remember the first couple times I dove into Ableton, I hated the key commands. So I pulled in as many from Logic as I could. And it made my experience getting to know Ableton a lot easier. So I have a bunch of custom key commands set up in Logic, for instance, and it even extends to commands on my MIDI controller. I can pull up different windows. I can hit record and play on my MIDI controller in Logic, and it makes my life a lot easier. All right, on to mistake number two. Make sure you're not using low quality or bad sounding presets or samples. Now you might be thinking, oh, that's rich coming from a sound designer. Well, I'm not saying this so you go out and buy my samples and my presets. I'm saying this just from purely the perspective of I made that mistake. I used samples that required a lot of mixing. And when you're starting out, you don't have the skill to know how to take a bad sample, polish that turd and turn it into something that you ultimately want. All right, so let's take a look at what I mean exactly by working with high quality samples and presets and why it's important. Now, just know that I'm not saying you should use high quality sound samples and presets loops as a crutch not to learn mixing. Definitely learn mixing as you go, but if you're just starting out or if you're fairly new to production, don't let this happen to you. It happened to me a lot. I didn't end up finishing a lot of what could have been good songs because I had a good bass line or a catchy melody or an interesting chord progression because I got so hung up on the mix aspect. I was like, oh man, my mix doesn't sound like enter Grammy winning mix engineers mix or a huge artist. And I never finished a lot of those tracks. Fast forward to about five years after that point, I actually reopened a lot of those old tracks. And I was like, damn, some of these melodies were actually fire. They were really good. And I just needed to actually be able to flesh out the idea. And then as my mixing my mixing uh, skills grew, I could actually be like, oh yeah, let me revisit this melodic idea or this chord progression or this bass line. All right, so let's take a listen to this guitar loop and this drum loop. All right, so if we bring up a frequency analyzer and listen to the guitar loop, we'll notice that a lot of the low ends already carved out. which means that it will work with an 808 right away. So if I play an 808 with it, if I play the right note, that'd be helpful. Right now, if this guitar had a bunch of low end rumble, that's gonna make it so your 808 is gonna be all washed out in the low end and then your kick's gonna struggle because of it. That's just one example of how when you're working with a loop or a sample or even a preset, if it's created with music production in mind, it should just work, right? Now let's actually, I wanna show you, cause you've heard the final guitar. I wanna show you the first version of what turned into that guitar loop and I'll play it with the drums. Well, here it is dry first. All right, so that's recorded straight from my uh, Stratocaster right into my audio interface and it sounds pretty bad. Let's say you downloaded, I don't think anyone would release a guitar loop that sounded this bad because it's just purely dry, but let's say you were working with something that was in this ballpark, right? Let's play it with the drums. Right, the chord progression is still cool. The vibe is, is cool, it just doesn't sound good. So this is an example of where you'd have to spend time mixing this. And if you don't know what you're doing, it's just gonna slow down that process, especially when you're starting out. So this was the first step. The second step was to throw on an amp designer. I love using THU, um, transient designer, some compressor, uh, some compression, a little bit EQ. Right. And 
And then as we, you know, there's another bounce with even more processing and then some chops and some tuning. And the final version that we get is what you heard a couple minutes ago, and then which is this. So it requires less mixing. Now, again, don't use this as a crutch to not learn mixing. I'm just highlighting that when you're starting out, try to find high quality samples. It'll make your life a lot easier. Now, let's look at the it, the other thing I mentioned where you wanna make sure you're using samples that fit the genre. So this is like a trap track, right? 808 I played here fits this genre perfectly, right? Let's look at an 808 that doesn't sound bad, but it just doesn't fit the genre. Here's an 808 from Nexus. It's kind of more of a house 808. Right, it's just not gonna fit with this. I could do another one here. So a simple one should work, right? Let's try a future 808. Right, it has a little bit of a different vibe. It's not catching that trap vibe that's in right now. All right, on to mistake number three. Don't get gas. Gas stands for gear acquisition syndrome to people who are audio nerds or music production people who just always you know want to buy the newest and latest gear. Don't fall into that trap thinking that you need the newest set of monitors, the newest keyboard controller, the newest drum machine or pad, right? Don't get stuck in that trap of thinking that you will reach this level once you have this piece of gear. It never pans out like that. You can run out and buy a new guitar, you're not going to be a better guitarist. You can run out and buy new monitors, not gonna make you better at mixing. You could run out and buy a new keyboard, right? You get the idea. The idea is that you want to get good with what you have. Now, I'm not saying don't you know improve your studio, just make sure they're very strategic choices and str strategic additions to your studio. So I've personally wasted a good chunk of money on gear that I've never used or it didn't really move the needle for me production-wise, right? It didn't make me a better producer or better musician. All right, now number four and five, they're kind of connected. So number four is don't obsess making your song perfect or any song or track or beat that you start perfect because you're chasing fool's gold. Nothing's ever gonna be perfect. I can't tell you how many times I've spent two months on a track and it ended up being worse than a track that I had to finish in a day. Now that goes right into the next point, which is point number five, and that is to finish what you start, even if you don't like it. I have, and I'll show you, I still have this problem. I have literally thousands, that's not an exaggeration, thousands of unfinished tracks, beats, and song ideas on I think four different hard drives now. And what that does is it means if you do that, if you get in the habit of doing that, you get really good at making eight bar, 16 bar loops, and you struggle with arrangement and getting an eight bar loop or a 16 bar idea and expanding it into an entire track or song. So if you don't ever finish what you start, you're, you're gonna get good at making eight to 16 bar loops. It's definitely a whole other skill set to think about arrangement, think about moving a song from the verse to the breakdown of the chorus out into the second verse. Or if you're a hip hop producer, you know, thinking about how to align different sections of your beat so the rapper has, you know, kind of a, kind of a guide or a roadmap to change up change up their flow or to do something different or you know to find the hook or the pocket of the beat those sorts of things all right so we're on to the final mistake that if i could go back in time and tell myself not to do i would and that is number 6 which is Use EQ and focus on learning how to get really good at using an equalizer. Because EQ is probably one of the most important processors or effects you have in your toolbox, especially when you're starting out. You should be able to get a good mix, a good sounding track or beat if you use a high quality sample, high quality preset, and you know how to use an equalizer so you, things just fit together, right? EQ allows you to get your kick and your 808, your kick and your bass to sit together. It's not compression necessarily. It's not, you know, other effects, saturation, or if it's like a vocal or a synth, it doesn't mean, you know, reverb and delay is gonna be your saving grace. It usually comes down to having good skills with an EQ. All right, so I've opened up a session that I've been working on and it's the verse section to a track. And I wanted to show this to you because the only mixing tool I'm really using to get all these different instruments to sit together so you can hear each one as loudly as I want you to hear them, it's just EQ. So let's take a quick listen.
So you get the idea. Now, this track is pretty fresh, it's pretty new, and I it's probably 70% of the way done. And I wanted to show you this because it really highlights the importance of equalization. That's really the only thing I've done to get these seven, maybe five to seven tracks to sit together so you can hear each one outside of just adjusting the volume or the level of each track. So I highlighted every track. You'll notice that each one is panned dead center. The first tool you have in your toolbox is obviously the level or the volume, and the second is probably pan position. Third is going to be EQ. So that's why I said it's the most important effect or processor you can really use in your mixes. So let's look at what's going on here from a frequencies per frequency perspective. So this first track here, when the intro hits, more of a full range of the frequency spectrum because there's nothing for it to compete with. As soon as competing instruments come into play, I'm going to load up EQ to get to fit together. So this is the same guitar track. I've just carved out more of the low end. Why did I carve out more of the low end? Because a bass came in in this section. And to get these two to sit together, I needed to give room for the bass in the frequency spectrum because they're both pan center for them to fit together. So this guitar is living at kind of a mid, low mid-range, right? It's definitely living at about, I don't know, 500 to 2K, somewhere in there. So I cut that out of the bass. So now these two fit together quite nicely. Now there's a couple other tracks in this section. There are these crazy cool weird presets I made in Serum. Sound like this. Vocal sounds, right? And these have some pretty interesting EQ going on. Now, of course, I've cut out the lows to get to fit with, the, obviously, the bass, if there was any lows. But I'm playing them up pretty high on my keyboard, so that wasn't that big of an issue. All right, so I know if you're a beginner, mid-side EQ might be, you know, a little much to digest. But it's actually pretty simple. Mid-side EQ is, is just the idea of having the flexibility to boost or cut frequencies either in the middle, the side, or both. It's up to you. So... Most equalizers by default, they work on a stereo spectrum basis, meaning that they're going to attenuate or boost frequencies depending on what you do in the EQ, right? If you, like, here's a here's a attenuation, I'm lowering, or here's a boost, it's going to apply to the entire stereo image or stereo field. Whereas with mid-side, you get to decide which band that you create is going to boost or cut the middle or the side. So that's what I did here. I'm boosting, I'm sorry, I'm cutting some of the low mids in the middle and I'm boosting the sides quite aggressively so let's solo that right I'm doing that just to again add some separation in this mix All right, guys, that's going to sum up this video. If you have any questions or comments, post those below. Like I said at the beginning of the video, I'm Echo Sowers. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you next time.